Welcome to the Jeffers Brief, only on Contra Radio Network. Hello again, Intelligentsia. I am back. I decided to take a week off. Please forgive me. All right. You know, a couple things. A few preppers out there and patriots who prep, and I always said uh, that uh, being a patriot and being a prepper usually intersect as a subculture. And this is true. Um, just because you are a prepper does not necessarily mean that you will survive a critical incident. For example, you're saying, but I got my supplies, I've got everything I need to get through a certain amount of time. What that time period is, that's up to you. However, it's going to depend on what the critical incident is where you are, what you're doing. For example, many people, like for example, even though you might live in the suburbs, you might work in, you know, the big city. For example, you might live in the Collar Counties around Cook County, but you might work in Chicago. And if a critical incident goes down in Chicago, whatever it may be, well, it won't be right now because those idiots keep closing it down and panicking on the COVID, but that's we'll get to that in a moment. But it's also going to depend on how you can get home. Can you get home? If you had to walk, for whatever reason, many miles. For example, my house to Chicago is about 36 miles or so. I think we're, I'm sorry, no. We're about 36 miles north and 26 miles west. So, could you walk that far? Would you have the appropriate tools for you to carry every day to be used to get you home? What's your physical condition? Can you do it? Can you do it? Now, I've railed over and over and over again. There's a difference between gym fit and prepper fit. Big difference. And I suggest you go back to some of the other older episodes I've done to get the idea. But you'll understand it. So the question is, Will you survive it? And it, again, it depends on what the critical incident is. What have you prepped for? If you've prepped for Planet X, eh, okay. I mean, that's up to you. I prep my, let's put it this way. I prep for scenarios that are most likely to happen. Zombie apocalypse is not there on the top three or four. It just isn't. Hell, if there was a zombie apocalypse, I'd probably be one myself, I guarantee it. But anyways, that's another story. So, can you survive it? Will you survive What happens after you get home? What if you had family members, you get home and they're not there? Or maybe part of your family's there. What are you going to do then? That's why you got to make sure your prepping plans are complete. If you don't talk about it with your family, what are you doing? What's the point? Unless, of course, you really don't like your family and you really don't care. Now, that's a possibility. Don't laugh. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Don't laugh about it. I'm just putting it, putting it out there. You know, and sometimes, you know, some of the easiest things we could stockpile, we overlook. For example... How many have ibuprofen? How many of you have, say, uh, jock itch or uh, athlete's foot spray stockpiled? How about peroxide or alcohol, rubbing alcohol? Not the alcohol you drink, but you should have the alcohol you drink as a bartering. 
because there will be people out there dying for a drink. My point is this. Sometimes we get so focused on the big things that we miss the little things to prep for. For example, prime example is rubbing alcohol. For God's sake, a year ago, you would think they'll never, ever, ever make any more rubbing alcohol again. You couldn't even find it. You know, so you got to get that 70% thing going. You know, you look for that 70% alcohol, you know, sometimes you were lucky you get 50%. But anyways, I digress. All right. Uh, a few weeks ago, I made mention on the episode that in my opinion, the way this COVID vaccine was made is the future of vaccines and other things. And lo and behold, here it is. It popped up in, uh, which one is it? Which was is this? Oh, yeah, the AARP newsletter. Yeah. The AARP newsletter. Say, John, why do you remember AARP? Because for $16 a year, I pay a hell of a lot less on my car and home insurance because of AARP. It's true. But here we have this article, and I want to share it with you. Let's talk about lessons learned from the pandemic. And it's not very long, but I wanted to share it with you, and this is why. I was so surprised when I saw it, because it's just a, a blurb. It's like, what the hell is this? I said, ah, I said this a few, a few weeks ago. And um, the title of the article is called, We Have Unleashed a Revolution in Medicine. It usually takes four to 20 years to create vaccines. For the new messenger RNA, which is mRNA, when you see it, the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, it took just a record 11 months. The process may have changed forever the way drugs are developed. Breakthroughs don't just happen in eureka moments. Supporting the development of the COVID-19 vaccines was more than a decade of research into mRNA vaccines, which teach human cells how to make a protein that triggers a specific immune response. The research has already overcome many hurdles, such as making sure that mRNA wouldn't provoke inflammation, says Lynn E. McQuatt, director of the University of Rochester Center for RNA Biology. Thanks to the recent breakthroughs, I, he says, or she says, I can't tell what they are, I expect to see the approval of more mRNA-based vaccines in the next several years, says mRNA researcher Norbert Party, a research assistant professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Future mRNA therapies could regenerate muscles in failing hearts and target the unique genera genetics of individual cancers with personalized cancer vaccines. Doctors will be able to sequence your tumor and use it to make a vaccine that awakens your immune system to fight it, Marquette says. I was right. Now, the question is this, my friends, and if you're not asking this question, I will ask it for you, and I will give you an answer. Just because the pharmaceutical companies come up with something like this, the fact is cancer treatments are big business for the pharma. For example, for you to get a chemotherapy, one single treatment of chemotherapy runs about ten dollars to $15,000 per treatment. That's a lot of money. Most people can only have three chemo treatments, and that's it. After the third one, if it doesn't help you, you're SOL. They will not give it to you again. So, do I get a personalized vaccine to treat my cancer or... Do they just keep picking my pocket? And that are the health insurance companies who, if you have health insurance, get to pick up the tab for that. I'm just putting it out there. I think we all know the answer. And 
to be fair, the Trump administration threw shitloads of money at the pharmaceutical companies to come up with a vaccine, which they did, which they withheld thought to the election because we can't give Trump any victories. No, no, no. Which, by the way, brings me to my next point. And this is going to get your blood boiling, all right? You're going to be livid. If you're not already livid, let me turn the fire up and really get the roiling boil. Now, Free Thought Project, my friends. The U.S. COVID relief was enough money to give every taxpayer $41,870, but we got peanuts instead. So spread the love on this one, my friends. Now this was, what's the date on this? March 14th, 10 days ago. Biden just signed his sweeping $1.9 trillion senator spending package into law. Once this bill hits the books, total taxpayer expenditures on ostensibly COVID relief will hit $6 trillion, Senator, which roughly estimated comes out to $41,870 in spending per federal taxpayer. Did you see anywhere near that much in a benefit? No. The sheer immensity of this spending is hard to grasp. For context, $6 trillion is more than one-fourth of what the U.S. economy produces in an entire year. And that's according to Fox Business. The COVID spending blowout is at least eight times bigger than the inflation-adjusted price tag of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. Moreover, the COVID spending bills have lost huge sums of money in unrelated carve-outs. Politician pet projects, corporate bailouts, fraud, waste, and more. Now, in the latest $1.9 trillion package, more than 90% of the spending is not, I repeat, not directly related to containing COVID-19. Only 1% of the money, about 15 to 20 billion, is spent on vaccines. Meanwhile, hundreds of billions go to bailing out poorly managed state governments' budget holes that predate the pandemic. And $86 billion rescues failing pension plans. Meanwhile, billions more go to Obamacare expansion and, and subsidizing public schools long after the pandemic. And that's just scratching the surface. Wait, let me turn the fire up a little bit more, shall I? I think I will. The number, all right, the math doesn't add up. The numbers here are really are quite damning. For the same $6 trillion in expenditure, the government could have given every federal taxpayer a $41,870 check. Or to think about it a bit differently, it could have written every American roughly an $18,181 check. Let's compare this to what most Americans actually received. Shall we? We shall. Only someone who fully collected expanded unemployment benefits throughout the pandemic and received all $3,200 in total of the stimulus payments likely received more than $18,181 in direct benefit from this spending package. And that's a relatively small fraction of the public. Because of the way government used outdated and arbitrary income data to determine eligibility, Many more taxpayers saw nothing or little in exchange for their $41,870 share of the cost. Perhaps just the initial $1,200 stimulus or none at all. Meanwhile, billions in checks went to dead people. But they got to get paid for voting. Don't forget that. So for almost all Americans, the actual benefits of the multiple pieces of lengthy stimulus legislation come in far, far below the figure that they would have received if the entire pile of money was just even split up and sent out. How can that possibly be considered a success? In fact, it's actually a net negative. 
Well, the trade-offs are inescapable. Too often, the stimulus conversation is simply framed around whether we should give money to a certain group of people or program rather than also including the trade-offs and the cost. The question isn't just, should we send people $1,400 stimulus checks? It is instead, should we send the people $1,400 stimulus checks at the cost of taking the equivalent amount or more if you factor in waste from other people? It's not just whether we should send $350 billion to state and local governments, but should we do so at the cost of taking an average of $2,442 per federal taxpayer? Now, the government is not Santa Claus, even though there are some that treat it as such, such as the perpetually unemployed. Money does not grow on trees, or as the great economist Ludwig von Mises put it, the government does not have the powers of the mythical Santa Claus. The truth is the government cannot give if it does not take from somebody, Mises wrote, in bureaucracy. They cannot spend except by taking out of the pockets of some people for the benefit of others. The government cannot create wealth out of thin air. It can only give anyone anything via three ways. <coughs> directly increasing taxes, which discourages economic growth or directly takes money away from people. Two, running up debt, which means higher taxes in the future plus interest creating a drag on economic growth. And three, which is what they really love to do, printing money, which stealth taxes the public via inflation. There's no such thing as a free lunch, and much to the chagrin of the spend-happy politicians, Santa Claus is not real. Government spending doesn't create wealth. It only transfers wealth, generally destroying a lot in the process. So unless Americans are actually seeing equal or greater benefit from spending compared to the cost, it's a raw deal for taxpayers. And for the federal government's COVID spending binge, it's not even close. Don't believe me? Well, did you see the $41,870 benefit from these programs? Or even $18,181? For almost everyone, the honest answer is no, no, and that's it. So there you go. The, you know what? You know what government doesn't need? The government doesn't need more lawyers. Doesn't. We don't need more lawyers in government. We don't need, oh God, yeah. We don't even, we don't need any more bureaucrats. The world needs more lawyers and bureaucrats like we need another hole in our head. And believe me, I'm one of them. Do not need another hole in my head. I got enough issues dealing with what I got. But there it is. There it is. And yet, they just keep spending and spending. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun, really? I think it's a ball. Oh, I just can't deal with it. You know, and then we, and then we got, you know, yes, we had the uh, shooting in Colorado. And again, the Democrats are saying, well, we got to ban weapons. They want to ban, get this, 205 assault weapons. There is no such, first of all, there's no such thing as an assault weapon. If you consider assault weapons to be fully automatic, they're already banned from the public. It's just another thing the government says that I cannot have. So assault weapons, if I mean, assault weapons, if you're going to define them, they should be fully automatic weapons. Those are already banned. But to ban 205 assault weapons... Because they look scary. And of course the Dems are saying we gotta ban these, we gotta ban these. Making people defenseless does not make them safer. If you take away my right to self defense, how does that make me safer? It doesn't. It doesn't. 
don't believe me? Case and point, Chicago. Every year, they have hundreds and hundreds of murders in Chicago. When the weather gets nice, that the murder rate in Chicago goes higher. Chicago has one of the strictest gun control laws on the books in the country. It does not work. It doesn't. Yet the mainstream media would have you believe that if we just add a little more to it, if we just let the politicians, the Democrats, push through these bans, we'll all be safer. No. 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 That doesn't work. It just doesn't. It's ridiculous. And it's dumb on top of it. (sighs) Now, has anybody noticed how the FBI is rounding up everybody from the January 6th insurrection? Oh, they're rounding people up right and left. Even people who who were there who had nothing to do with it. But by God, if you're going to burn down a federal courthouse in in a Portland or Washington state, well, we can't find anybody. We can't do anything. Yeah, right. And and believe it or not, the federal courts are when they go in to bring some of these people that they've arrested, the federal courts are laughing the prosecutors out of the courtroom saying, "Really? This is your this is your case?" Well, they've been in custody. Well, you better let them out of custody because your case sucks. It's good, to, nice to see the federal courts actually doing something. All right. All right, let's see what we got here. What else have we got here? There's so much crap I can't even stand it. By the way, for, just so you all understand this, there's been a leaked email. And this is important. This is important, my friends. Now, according to trending politics, the American people are getting visibly acclimated to a Kamala Harris presidency. And a new director from the White House is one of the most concrete developments that federal officials are getting warmed up for the Harris takeover. And it's, ha- it's happening, my friends. I said it, I said it weeks ago. They're going to 25th Amendment Biden. Despite long-standing security protocols against the president and vice president traveling together, Biden and Harris are virtually inseparable. They even travel on Air Force One together to a recent speaking event in Atlanta, although Biden himself was forbidden from doing so under the Biden administration. In addition, Harris has been taking over a key role in foreign policy making. She has met with numerous heads of states in one-on-one meetings and is included in all the president's IC briefings. Now, there is a formal recognition of Harris's role as a vital member of the Biden administration, breaking from the usual presumption that the vice presidency is a low-key and less visible office. Now, according to a report at the website Outspoken, a leaked email shows that top White House communication team member is directing that official correspondence at all federal agencies include mentioning Vice President Kamala Harris. Quote, please be sure to reference the current administration as the Biden-Harris administration and public and official public communication, the directive reads. Neither of the at White House Twitter accounts from the previous two administrations mention the vice president in the account's description. The report noted, under the Obama administration, the account description read, follow for the latest from President Obama and his administration. The highly specific language also appears on the websites of all 15 executive departments. Press releases and other communications from departments of agriculture, comments, commerce, <laughs> comments, that should be, never mind, that's another story. Commerce, defense, education, energy, health, and human services, Homeland Security, HUD, Interior, Labor, State, Transportation, Treasury, and Veterans Affairs, and the Attorney General, 
all exclusively refer to the Biden-Harris administration in lieu of only naming the president, which has been customary until now. Now, President Biden has not given a press briefing in, in over two months in office. He has not given a single State of the Union address, one of the latest first-time presidents to do so. He is tripping going upstairs and often refuses to take unscripted qu questions. On Thursday, while delivering a statement on the coronavirus pandemic, Biden let it slip once again who he thinks is president of the United States. Don't believe me? Listen to it here. Now, when President Harris and I took uh, a virtual tour of a vaccination center in Arizona not long ago, one of the nurses on that, on that tour, injecting people, giving vaccinations, said that each shot was like administering a dose of hope. What? What? Did you hear it at the beginning, my friends? Huh? Did you? Did you? If not, let me play it again for you. You'll hear it right off the bat. Listen carefully. Here it is. Now, when President Harris and I... Did you hear that? There you go. That's it. This is not the first time Biden has made such an error, although prior to taking office. On the campaign trail, he slipped and called for the forthcoming administration the Harris-Biden administration. We also have recently discovered that former President Obama and President Biden are in close working cooperation with one another. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, who's in way over her head, admitted this at the press briefing on Monday. She says, quote, President Obama is taking part in an event for the Affordable Care Act about an hour. The question is, has he visited the White House or do you know how often he has spoken to President Biden, the reporter asked. She replies, I will say, having a unique view of this question, they were not just president and vice president, they are friends. They consult and talk about a range of issues, and I would expect that continues through the course of the President Biden's presidency. You know, what you didn't add, what you should have added, which only should be a few more months. The leaked email reveals an unprecedented directive to warm federal agencies up to the idea of President Harris, who never got one vote in the primaries, by the way. It only further corroborates what the American people know. The shadow presidency has already begun. I know you don't want to believe it, but it's true. And when you listen to her, when she gets thrown a tough question, you'll hear her cackle because she's trying to buy just a few seconds time to think of an answer. So, all right, help. some of you may have noticed this great hat, huh? You like that? Great hat. You can buy one. Help support CRN. You can buy them. And here's the website. Get your pencil and papers ready. There will be a quiz on this later. It is www.contraradionetwork, one word, dot Q B stores dot com. I'm going to say it again. www.contraradio network, one, just put it all together, no spaces. Dot Q as in Queen, B as in Bumblebee, stores.com. Get your hats there. If you would like it, they're pretty sharp. They come in, we've got, we got some different styles and whatnot. Remember, Every, you know, every time you buy something through there, you could get shirts, you get all kinds of apparel there. Every time you buy something, yeah, it's a, little, it's a tad more expensive. But let me tell you something, my friends. You've seen me many times wearing shirts that say CRN on there. I've had these shirts. I checked the purchase record. I have seen these. I've had these shirts for three, two to three years. The stitching has not come out. They're still in great condition. These are not just printed on there, you know, with silk screening and all that. These are embroidered. Embroidered, my friends. Don't believe me? Look in there. See that? Embroidery. 
These are quality hats. You're going to get a hat that you're going to like. It's going to last a while. we got a few different styles. Please go there. Do some shopping. I think you'll like it. And it, again, hey, it helps support CRN. All these shows you get for free. This time you order something, I get a little something back, and you get a nice hat or a nice shirt or jacket or whatever you want. So, leaving it there for you. All right, my friends, don't forget to listen to uh, my friend David Kirshner, new guy, author, blogger, good guy, good patriot. Listen to his show. We're running it here. I hope you like it. Um, his wife is a, a biology, is she a biology teacher, a professor? I don't remember. Anyways, episode four, you might want to listen to. Here's a question for you, my friends, before I leave. If, if you get vaccinated, why do you still need to wear a mask? If I'm vaccinated, I can't get the virus. If I get the virus, I can't spread it because my immune system will suppress it and destroy the virus. Therefore, I can't transmit it to anyone else. Why, why? Do I need to wear a mask? Oh. Yeah, let's see you try that one, my friends. Because if we follow Fauci's logic, we will always have to wear a mask all the time. The bottom line is COVID-19 is here to stay forever. Forever. Are we supposed to wear a mask forever? Remember, Biden and Harris both said during the debates in 2020, we're not going to take the vaccine if Trump made it. We don't trust it. Yeah, like Trump's in the fucking basement of the White House mixing chemicals and coming up with this, right? That's how stupid it is. Now, you listen to all these big city mayors, all the Democrats, we got to get vaccinated, we got to get vaccinated. Well, fine. If I get vaccinated, I don't need to wear a mask. I'm not endangering myself, and I can't endanger others if I'm vaccinated, correct? Putting it out there. And don't forget Fauci. When this first broke a year ago, and you look for it, you'll find it. Fauci coming and say, don't wear a mask. It's not going to do you any good. Then like a week later or so, everybody wear a mask, everybody. Except if you're a Democrat. Then the laws don't, the rules don't apply to you. Speaking of which, I got to tell you, I've been watching this drama play out between the city of Chicago and the Chicago Teachers Union. The city of Chicago has been over backwards to get these schools open. And the teachers union keeps coming up with these lame excuses why they can't do this, why they can't go back. First, they wanted to get vaccinated. So you said, fine, we'll put teachers at the front of the line, we'll get you vaccinated, and you can go. Now the teachers union is telling their members, don't tell CPS, the Chicago Public School System, the city of Chicago, if you got vaccinated, don't say anything about it. You know what? I got to tell you, if I was Beetlejuice, I mean, Mayor Lightfoot, I'd start firing these people in groups of 25 to 50. You're not entitled to your job. You have a job to do. You wanted this. We did what you asked. You have not bargained in good faith. Start firing people. I guarantee you the first 25 people they fire, all the other clowns will start towing the line. And if they all don't start towing the line, fire another 25 and keep firing them in groups of 25 or 50. By God, there are people out there that will come and do the job. Private schools have been open. They got kids in their schools, have since fall. So don't tell me how unsafe it is. Don't want to hear it. So that's my take on that. Start firing these clowns. And for the local school board, if your local school board 
is getting into this whole, uh, well, what do they call it? The um, critical race theory thing. You better start going to those uh, school board meetings and raising holy hell. The teachers' unions have gotten way too big for their britches. They need to be put in their place. And the only people that can put them in their place are the parents. They're the only people. And you got to put the school boards also in their place. Let them know either do this or you won't be on the school board next time around. It's pretty simple. School education has one purpose, and it is not indoctrination. It's core academic education, not indoctrination. Mathematics, language, history, social studies. They should be teaching kids how money works. This is how money works. This is how the stock market works. This is why. Like consumer education. Got to start teaching them that. How many kids actually know how a checkbook works? How to balance a checkbook? Very few, I think. Geography? Got to know where these places are. Things are happening there. And if you live here in the United States like I do, let's be quite honest about it. It's one of the few places in the world where we're living in a, almost like a fantasy. We don't have open warfare on the streets. Do we have hunger? I don't know. Seems to me there's a lot of food going, give, being given out, and that's fine. We have electricity, we have running water. Many times it's clean, most of the time it's clean. We have sewer treatment plants, when, unless you're in San Francisco or California, Los Angeles area, where you just take a crap on the streets and you know, ah, eh, who cares? But don't worry, people in California are fleeing there. Now I understand it. Your bad voting habits have allowed super majorities and Illinois is one of them too and you're in your the alleged the state legislature and they have destroyed your state destroyed it fiscally all in the name of political power now if you voted for Democrats over and over again you should not be allowed to leave those states you chose that you live with it. Now, most of the people on the coast in California vote Democratic. On the other hand, those in the eastern half of California usually vote conservative. But they are always outvoted because the west coast of California, the coastal area of California, is more populous. Hence, you get your supermajorities. Now, of course, they're not going to do what I ask and say, oh, wait a minute. You're a registered Democrat. You're trying to leave California. Oh, no, 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 no. You stay here. You get to live with what you thrust upon everyone else. So they let them leave, and they go to other very well-run states, and they don't change their bad voting habits. They want the new place they move to to escape the crap that they voted upon themselves to be just like the place they just left if you choose to leave the crappy state that you voted for that you allowed over and over again decades and decades of bad voting then change your vote don't turn the new place you moved into a replica of the toilet you just left makes no sense all right, that's it for me. I've been railing and carrying on here for a bit longer than I wanted to. All right, thanks for listening. Order up your hats. Woo! This, we got all kinds of different hats. So, yeah. Visit us if you would, please. I'd appreciate it. And don't forget to listen to the other host. Uh, don't forget the prepper guy, Mark Boyle. He's on Raising Holy Hell. I like Mark. He's a different cat, but I like him. 
Listen up to him. All right. And don't forget Don Lowry on the marketing podcast. You're in marketing. You might want to listen to this. Got a business. You might want to listen to him. All right. Until next time, I'm John Jeffries on the Jeffries Brief. Be safe. Be alert. Be vigilant. We'll talk to you then. Have a good one. Later.